Welcome to the Harry Ransom Center. My name is Roy Fluginger. I'm the Senior Research Curator of Photography here at the Center. And it has been my duty and my privilege, especially the latter, to be the curator for the Fritz Henley In Search of Beauty show and to also the author of the subsequent book which we have just published on the work as well. Um, I want to say that it has been not only a privilege but a in, in many parts a labor of love as well too because I have been a fan of Fritz Henley since I first got it, interested in photography. Way back in the 1950s and 60s when I used to steal my cousin's photo magazines and read them and, and see this work by this strange and wonderful man with the strange and wonderful German name that would always pop up and the images would always stick in the back of my mind. He is a person who has fascinated me since that time and it has been our privilege to know him since 1979 here at the Ransom Center and to work with him on the establishment of the master print collection of Fritz Henley here at the Center. Although he would be inspired by beauty throughout his life, Fritz Henley chose photography rather than words to define its magic and bringing to the art a clear vision coupled with superb technical expertise. He proceeded in that course for some six decades to champion a unique blend of realistic and romantic photography, which transcended both stylistic trends and a great variety of subject matter. The exhibition, the work on the archive, and the book has all been amply supported by Stephen and Judy Gluckstern of the Lucky Star Foundation and Danny and Robin Greenspun of the Culture Dog Foundation. And I applaud and thank them for their help throughout the course of this project. I also, of course, thank Tom Staley, the director of the Ransom Center, and the entire staff. It has been a collaborative effort in many respects, and they have helped us see this through to the glorious finale we have outside, as well as been a privilege to work with the people at UT Press and with the designers at Pentagram to do this publication too. And I thank all of them for that. To begin at the beginning, our guests this evening, and we can bring them up in light as we do this. <laughs> Marguerite Henley was raised in Washington, D.C where she studied voice as a teenager. While vacationing on St. Croix in 1952, she met Fritz and soon became his model, from which his book, Figure Studies, was created. They married in 1955 and permanently moved to St. Croix as their home in 1958, where they raised their three children. In addition to being a model and a mother, Marguerite continued to assist Fritz's career, traveling with him and publishing his, until his death in 1993. She currently resides on St. Croix with her partner, Paul Voiter-Shark. Paul, Paul, I'm sorry, I had to get that name right. <laughs> Tina Henley, the second daughter of Fritz and Marguerite, was raised on St. Croix, where she acquired her passion for travel with her family on many of Fritz's business trips to Europe. She earned a degree in photography and anthropology in 1982 from the University of New Mexico. And in the mid-1980s, she spent several years assisting Fritz with printing and organizing the archives here in Austin. She currently lives on St. Croix, where she freelances her photography. Martin Henley, the tall and well-tanned gentleman at the end, <laughs> was Fritz and Marguerite's son was raised on St. Croix, where his early years were also highlighted by the summer trips to Europe. In 1985, he graduated from the University of Colorado with a fine arts degree in photography. Martin also worked with Fritz for several years here in Austin, printing and organizing his archives. And he continues to reside on St. Croix with his wife, Therese Donarski, where he is completing the building of his house. Let me just say that since Fritz's death in 1993, the Henleys have continued in their dedication to the vast project of organizing his life's work. They have been champions of that, and I applaud them for it. This evening, we will have a discussion. Towards the end, I will pass microphones to the audience as well. We want you to be able to ask them questions also if you so feel inclined. 
but we're privileged to have them, Marguerite, Tina, and Martin Henley. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and welcome back. Thank you. Good for here. <laughs> Absolutely good. Uh, in putting the show together, we men we always ran into this fascinating problem of, gee, I really like that picture, and that is an outstanding photograph, and it won't fit because we don't have enough room. Because when you edit a program, of course, or a show, of course, you diminish the work. You have to, the size of the our exhibit just won't take it all. But you have work with Fritz of such quality and such variety that it's always been a challenge. Have you always, like he did, had one particular photograph that you really loved? Or was it something that you changed around with as you went with the work and saw his work? And you can anyone pitch oh, one. It's so overwhelming, the body of his work. But I found myself gravitating toward the desert flower mm -hmm. and Fujiyama simply because for me, they were, uh, they were a very meditative photograph. I found it very, better than taking a drug to calm down, mm -hmm. just <laughs> sitting and looking at that, which I don't do, <laughs> uh, those two. But I love so many of them. What can I say? <laughs> okay. And the same question to either of you? Yeah, I'll pipe in. Um, I can certainly say it's changed, or I've just pinpointed many, many over the years. And um, I know when I was younger, it was the desert flower that was kind of like this emblem in our home. Um, the New York at night, the one that looks uh, like a radar, the lights turning, was always one that really fascinated me because it was very, um, it was a different way of seeing that he did. Um, it wasn't just the straight image. Um, and I will say that, you know, since he passed and all the involvement we've had, it's been totally amazing finding new images that he never printed, we never saw, that are like, whoa. And the one that I'm thinking of that you put in the show, I'm very grateful that you did, is um, the diver in Mexico. Um, and he never, we never saw a print of that. And when we looked at the contact sheet, I think there are like three images that he, or three shots that he took, and one of them was that image, and, you know, which is a whole other thing, you know, about how he just was so selective in the shooting. I probably can't really expand too much on that, but he has had his classic images, like they said, desert flower. But I know we're going to find more images mm -hmm. because we have not begun to look through the negative files. Fritz edited through the years, but we found other images over the years that was like, why didn't he print this? Mm -hmm. Take, for instance, Sisal Factory in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. We found that later on. Fritz never really printed that, and it's like, wow. Where did that come from? So, I mean, we've got thousands of negatives up there still to search through. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> there, there are other treasures upstairs. Well, we can get started in an hour. I know. He, many photographers, especially when they're young, go through several experimentations and testings. They try different cameras, they try different processes, they try different sizes, they try different works. And as you get older, you narrow down into certain areas that you want to work with technically. It's always quite remarkable to me that uh, you began photography at all seriously in 27, 28. And by 1930, he had settled on the Roloflex, which was at the time very new, and stayed with that format throughout his career. Uh, he loved the square frame, I know. He loved the flexibility of it. I, read all the arguments for it in the course of his books that he wrote about it. Uh, in commenting upon it and working with it, did he ever say anything else to you about it that was, that was attractive to it or why he would not try other, other formats? Oh, sure. Or One main thing for Fritz was composing on the ground glass. He knew exactly what he wanted to get mm -hmm. because later, hardly any of his photographs were cropped. You know, and, and edit, uh, editors might say, well, you know, they want to take it and they'll crop it here and crop it there. And that would drive Fritz up the wall. <laughs> so, yeah, that was one of the main features. Okay. And 
<laughs> That's what I always heard. Yeah. I mean, it was like the gift of being able to see the image right yeah. there and, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, grand glass. Okay. And being, being known as Mr. Rowley, how could he change? <laughs> I mean, that, he was, was married <laughs> to Rowley. Good argument at that point as well. Well, I think it was and really a, an, a, an anatomical appendage to the man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I know for a fact from early on, of course, that they, they are in part responsible for, of course, the publication of his first book and ultimately him boxing his way over to America in 1936, too, yeah. because of their support, mm -hmm. too. But he was always faithful and loyal to them as well. How about the big transference when the twin lens reflex went away and the single lens came out? Uh, his writing about that said that he embraced it, was very enthusiastic from the first. Was that something you found, or did he have difficulty adjusting at all in the course of that? I, you mean the Tule roll line? Yeah. I didn't find that he found any problem with it. Okay. But he was always right with that two and a quarter one, that regular okay. one that he worked with for so many years. Okay. But you know, Roli, every time they had a new thing out, he got it. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first uh -huh. he got, you know. Yeah. Or are you talking about the SL66 in general? Yes. Yeah, so oh, you're talking about that. Well, he okay. loved the versatility because he could change the cassette from black and white to color and still change it back again without having to use the full roll, roll of film. And it was not uncommon for him to carry two cameras, one with color and one with black. And oh, and tell shot. me about it. <laughs> <laughs> she carried the cameras. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I do have a couple of professional questions about your working relationship. Uh, the first in terms of being a cameraman's assistant. Uh, I, know <laughs> that, I, I know there is this, this, this marvelous moment in... Uh, in Alfred Hitchcock's rear window when uh, Jimmy Stewart is rejecting the advances of Grace Kelly, which you automatically know that's a work of fiction. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know Jim, about Jim, that. Jimmy yeah. Stewart is the photographer and she is the society girl who wants to marry him, but he doesn't want to because he's a rugged globe-trotting photographer who's going all around the world and, then you know, I can't have time for this sort of thing and the like, you know. Um, by the way, when they get together in them, and I think it's very fascinating that she puts down a book of adventure travels and picks up a Harper's Bazaar magazine for the final shot. But that's <laughs> yeah. near there. But for you, well, what was, was it like to step into it, that uh, No, no, it wasn't really like that. But okay. the thing that used to drive me up a wall for a while, and I didn't really understand what happens in the creative flow at the mm -hmm. moment. And we were in Yugoslavia on a Sunday morning at church, in one of the churches, and there was a little kind of a bridge up and the church was a little below, and the women had their beautiful traditional <laughs> costumes on, and Fred said, oh, this is great. So he got his cameras, I'm holding one bag and whatever, and right next to him, and all of a sudden, I must have gotten a little too close to him, and he was so, so rude to me. So after he took that photograph, I said, you treat me like this one more time, I'm gonna throw your cameras down the ravine. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that didn't happen often, but mm -hmm. I understood after a while what happens when they're in that moment, and it's a moment for Fritz. Mm -hmm. This is the fleeting second, because this is, he's not setting this up. Most of Fritz's photographs were absolutely the moment. So I had, I understood that. And it helped our relationship. <laughs> but it really did, you know. It just chilled it off a bit, you know. <laughs> uh, the creative arts, okay. Uh, as well, however, you inspired him. Arthur Ullman, when he wrote in The Model Wife about photographers who had collaborated uh, with their wives, you were subject and inspiration for some of the finest nudes that were ever done that Fritz did in the 50s. Uh, had you ever modeled before? And if not, what was it like to enter into this production of this significant? Well, I'll be absolutely honest with all of you. I, uh, in Washington, before I met Fritz, I was a portrait model for Andrea Zarega, an excellent Italian artist there. And then, and, but I never posed in the nude for anybody. And Fritz had asked me in St. Croix when we met if he could take some pictures of me. 
And it wasn't long before we realized there was a tremendous connection between us. There was a, chem a chemistry with, between us. And that followed through. And then he asked me if he could take nudes. And hey, I was in love with him then. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Took my robe off. And you can see this in the photographs. If you really look carefully, you can see a little more than just a photograph. There was passion there. And that carried all through our 40 years together. Mm. All right. Good. And did you, was it a sort of free session? Did you come up with ideas and things like oh, that no. too? Whoa. Did you plan them no, ahead no, of time? No, 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 no. <laughs> Fritz was a visionary, remember? <laughs> so what you're saying is the collaboration theory is going to go out the window now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So. yeah, right, maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Very good. Well, that's marvelous still. And did, then when you work in a situation like that with someone every day, and not only with the news, but later when you accompany him on, especially on the European tours for the books that he was doing then and everything, um, how does he approach it on a daily basis when he goes out? I mean, did he know that he wanted to photograph this particular subject that day? No. Did he just go out and look? It was know. mostly spontaneous. Mm -hmm. He would go into a village, for example, Rothenburg in Germany, and off he went. He'd go out, he'd just put his camera box down, get his cameras ready, and he went out right away. He didn't plan to go later because Fritz always felt that his very first spontaneous Photographs were the one that were the best, and it's true, they were. I, I note, and Tina mentioned it too, I believe, that, that in the case of the Mexican diver, when you look at a contact sheet, there's not 12 exposures of one subject. No, no. He waited, he got what he wanted, he came back with one or two shots and went on to the next. Is that something you found particularly stylistically that, that, he, that he always did throughout his career? He never yeah. set things up as a rule. He set portraits of them, things like that, like Pablo Casals and mm -hmm. people. But Fritz was, it was really, you might say, spontaneous most of the time. Mm -hmm. He'd see something, and whoa, got to get it right away. We chased more nuns around <laughs> than you can imagine. <laughs> and I'm serious. I mean, well, I'd say, Fritz, come on. Oh, no, they went up that street and down that street. In Italy, you know what it's like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and Fritz is. <laughs> Fritz's philosophy was don't overshoot. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Don't overshoot. Okay. So I'll speak to that also because um, when I became involved in photography in my late teens, my um, very first experience of going out of the country, I was on this program abroad with a school, and he had given me a very small Rolleiflex 35 millimeter way back when, but this was like this big adventure I was going on, and he gave me a twin lens reflex camera. And, you know, all he directed me, all he instructed me to do was don't overshoot, and he gave me 12 rolls of film. And how that translates for a twin lens reflex is 144 shots. Well, I thought I was going with this wealth of film, and it was. And, you know, if there's one, I mean, there's several things Fritz certainly has imparted to me along the way, but one of the key things was two things that I think Marguerite was saying was, you know, being in the moment, you know, not having this projection around what you think you're going to see or, or, you know, go out to shoot, but just to be in the flow of the day and see and just be in that looking space and to be really um, precise, you know. I mean, he abhorred the idea of going out and going click, 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 you know, when they finally got cameras that could do that. It was like, it made no sense to him. Because I know he felt so much of his process was literally engaging in that moment and being there for it. And I think that speaks to what his work is about. So what? I came back with two shots. No. <laughs> <laughs> two? <laughs> yeah, what, 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 I, what I think fascinates me is early on he went through, I guess, what, what has been termed the pictorial phase, the idea of coming back with the perfect picture. Uh, the idea of photographing with a certain formula of, of pictorialism at the time. Uh, what was Edward Weston said about consulting the rules of composition before 
taking a picture is kind of like consulting the laws of gravity before taking a walk. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of, I, I, I think, something that he got out of his system early on and then went to the, to the other extreme of paying attention to what was going on in Germany at the time with people like Laszlo Moholy-Nagy and others who were trying the modernist sort of work too. And then there's the strange melding of those two combined with his instantaneous approach to do that, that he would go out, seek for that image and go on to the next and go on to the next. Um, so I've always been particularly interested in that blend that is always there in his work. The technique, however, extends not just from the picture taking, but also into the dark room. Mm -hmm. And I know you two in particular, and perhaps you got drafted into it earlier too, Marguerite, were involved for years with the whole making of the prints for this archive. Spent many hours in the dark with Fritz. Yes. <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about that half of, of his photographic career and, and his work? Do you want to start since you, you were the leader? Yeah. <laughs> um, I had already had some printing training by the time I worked with my dad in the darkroom here mm -hmm. um, in the university. And I, I think the thing that struck me the most, again, about him was he had such a sensitivity to light, and that was like such a key, you know, awareness in both his photographing and in being in the darkroom. And nine times out of ten, we didn't set a timer. He literally looked at the negative, he could see the density of it, and we might have done a few tests here and there, and Bomi goes, okay, eight seconds on that, and he was like, whoa. <laughs> and he just had this amazing sensitivity and intuition about it. Yeah. And that's like an amazing gift that I think I really gathered. And this was even if he would change papers and change developers and things too? Or just he just, really he just knew the standards? Much when we were, okay. Yeah, or developers. Well, we did when I came on though. Yeah. Okay. Good. I know too you spoke at times of, you know, he was very demanding about how he wanted the image to look in every instance. Mm -hmm. and if something was not burned correctly or did not print out correctly or something like that. Uh, was it a process of elimination or was he really good at hitting it the first time? There was a bit of, of elimination, but I mean, he was pretty, pretty right on. Okay. I probably, I'm, when I worked with him, I, I think I might have been a little more technical because I was just fresh out of college and I, you know, I was doing test strips and being very accurate on, on the times on the prints. But unfortunately, I think like our first session, we were doing early work, and those were the glass plates, and those were, some of them were thin, some of them were damaged, so it was, it was tricky printing those. Yeah. And, you know, we spent hours in there, but he was, you know, dodging and burning where he needed it, and I was doing the times and the specific developing times, and we, we pulled our prints, so. For those of you who, who might not be aware of it, uh, <laughs> One of the reasons I included some very large prints in our show out here was simply because even at an early time in his career, in 1936, in fact, when he did his first one-person show in Japan, uh, he included very large prints in it at the time, uh, up to three to four feet in size. Uh, and this, of course, was way ahead of his time. It is very much the fashion now in the 90s and onward to do this sort of thing. But Fritz was experimenting with that at the time. And the reason he was able to do that was because of this rather flawless technique he had uh, in the darkroom, as well as with the work he did with the camera. Also, of course, the Roloflex provided him with two and a quarter negatives, which were much bigger than the 35 millimeters, which was the popular trend at the time. And he was able to make these images. And in fact, I guess you knew the story of the fact that when he was first showing his work in New York City, he wouldn't show them the contact sheets because they could tell it was done with a two and a quarter. He'd do, enlarge, he'd do enlargements and people thought he was working with a big format camera. Such was his style and technique at the time. I digress, but I think that's a very fascinating point about his work as well. Okay then, so you have grown up on an island. What led him I know he was proud of his Amer American citizenship and stayed with it and then was looking for a home in the islands or what, what led to the Virgin Islands? How did that come about? Well, he had been married before. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he went to Hawaii. He took his first wife and little boy with him, photographed. I think he made two trips to Hawaii and he made a book on Hawaii. 
And he fell in love with the people, the culture, the diversity there, and the geography. And then he came back, and he got a fashion assignment. Harper's Bazaar, one. Holiday. Forgot. Holiday. Oh, Holiday. Going down to uh, Venezuela. So when they got to Puerto Rico, they found out there was a slight revolution in Venezuela. <laughs> so they said, OK, now where do we go? And Fritz looks up at a map on the wall in the airport, and he spots the three Virgin Islands. He said, why don't we take the models they had the Everybody, they had a whole gang out. They did then, you know. Maybe they still do. And uh, let's go over to St. Thomas. So they went to St. Thomas, and they stayed at the 1829er. So he did a lot of some of his very first Virgin Islands you have in the show there. Fashion, very beautiful. And then they decided to go over to St. Croix. Did quite a bit of work there on the harbor. And he drove around the island, and his wife, at the moment, they were separated. His wife, at the moment was, no, Amy, his wife was in the States. He went there, looked around the island, and thought, wow, this is a small version of Hawaii. That's the big island, St. Croix. The other islands, are, the other two are much smaller. So he really was attracted to St. Croix. So, you know, he, in the meantime, you know, he went back to New York, and he and his wife separated, and she moved down to St. Croix and lived there with the little boy for a while, and he lived in New York. And then he decided to go there and live. After we had met, he decided to go down. Mm -hmm. And that's where we remained to stay. And he said, the only way they're gonna take me out is feet first. That's okay. what happened. Right. And it was, Loved it. <laughs> and you did have, and I'm correct, he could still maintain his business in New York. He oh, yeah, flights well, to and from. He had a great dark room, Motel, a custom dark room, and um, you could fly, it didn't take too long to fly. We had a pretty good postal service. He mailed the, the film up to New York. He could have been anywhere on the globe, <clears throat> so it made it easy. And New York was insane. He left the studio in Manhattan to come home at 8 at night and left in the morning late because of the traffic. And he said at one point, this is for the birds. We'll go and live in St. Croix. So we closed up our little house up there. And we had two children. Mm -hmm. We had one child. We had Maria. Went down with Maria and settled there. We lived in Christiansted for a while, and then the other, three, other two. And we built a little house on the hill, which you saw. Very small house. Some people in Europe thought just because he's Fritz Henley, we have a swimming pool. We did. We had the whole sea, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we've lived there. That's been, the roots go all the way down, 350 feet down. <laughs> we love it. It's Still a, love it. It's an impressive view of that swimming pool, I will say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. True. It's very true. It, it's, I had the fortune of doing doing heavy research in, in, in the Virgin Islands for a week with this process and was trying to figure out how to call Tom up and tell him that I had other stuff. I really needed to extend my research for a couple yeah. of weeks <laughs> uh, because it was, uh, there was points about Fritz's work and my tan line that I both had to work on. So, but anyway, but it was a idyllic place. What's it like growing up there though? I mean, for, for you as opposed to the big city and everything. Well, I didn't know the big city, and um, it was fabulous growing up there in the 60s. Um, that was when St. Croix was still really um, kind of an offbeat, um, expat place, mm -hmm. and very un-Americanized at that point. No McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken like we have now. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great. I mean, you know, my memories of our childhood are just about being outside, being in nature, swimming, you know, playing in the woods. and. Um, I'm really grateful for that. It was great. And we had fabulous schools down there. So it wasn't, I, you know, I know Fritz's brother and sister, they never came to visit us, but they had this image of the islands being like this totally wild place. And Fritz was raising three heathens down there. <laughs> <laughs> there were fabulous private schools. And, you know, we got to travel, you know, when we got a little bit older with them. So, you know, I feel like I had this utterly amazing childhood being raised there and not being, you know, so branded into mainstream mm -hmm. America. <laughs> so the, uh, he also wrote quite a bit, and, and in fact it is true that uh, when he set out 
to reside there. He really photographed not only the Virgin Islands, but the entire Caribbean. It was the subject of a book. Mm -hmm. uh, people comment sometimes about his, his, the artwork he does, but he could also do significant documentary work, too, and photograph the people of the surrounding islands and the culture and the society very well, too. I found that particularly fascinating about it, too. In fact, that Caribbean book continues to fascinate me because he really, I think, sought out the different cultures that were there. It was a great trip. Yeah. And that are no longer in that way. Yeah. yeah. And he had a particular knack of befriending the, the local people. And, you know, here's this German man coming in, and they're like, well, who are you? And it's like he immediately gets along with them and taking their pictures. Mm -hmm. And nowadays you can't do that. They're like, <laughs> Did he walk right in and shoot? Did he first go up to meet no. them? What was his technique? No, I was the one who broke the ice. Oh. <laughs> in Europe, okay. in South America, in Israel, in Turkey, I was the one who went in and charmed the people and got them to say okay. Because Fritz would run out and take pictures. Oh, no. <laughs> when we were in Israel and we went down toward the Dead Sea, that was right after the Seven Days War, mm -hmm. there were some Bedouins out in the sand, way out there, and Fritz said, oh, well, I gotta get that, you know. So we went out and I had carried a camera. It wasn't in the case, it was around my neck. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to do this. He tried to photograph them and they got angry. Uh -oh. So he stayed over there, I was here, I pointed my camera at him, and he had his this way at him, and they were looking at me, and he got the picture. <laughs> Fritz was very tricky. <laughs> he really was. He knew how to get it. So one way or the other, he was going to get it, and he did. But he said, let's get out of here, and our driver said, because <laughs> the man, you know, they don't like that, and he said, they have knives, so you better get in the car quick. <laughs> so we did. Okay. <laughs> Close calls. So he did depict the other cultures, but he wasn't deep ethnographic photography. No, right. Per se. Okay. right. Good. Get the image. How about color? Uh, when did he first take the plunge into color? And, 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 it was in and the 40s, wasn't it? it? The early 40s, maybe 43. I don't know. It was before I met him. Mm -hmm. But he had some very early, like, AYR ranch that you have in the show. Right. That was some of the first color. Okay. Yeah. Did it tend to explode and really get a, uh, more of it in the in the islands, or was it something you'd always taken though? He was so into black and white. Mm -hmm. I think color was wonderful, and he enjoyed it. But don't you think he really preferred yeah. black and white? There was so much more nuances in black and white. Mm -hmm. But I think I the, the Caribbean did bring out his inspiration. Well, color, yeah, though. sure, because the Caribbean <laughs> book when we went up the Orinoco River, and we went to British Guiana, French Guiana, Paramaribo, and then we took a boat uh, up to the uh, Amerindians, the little logo on the, on the book, on the mm -hmm. Caribbean book, and we had more fun because we took a brassiere to the Bush Negro settlement. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have brassieres there. And we got the girl to put it on, and she just about freaked out. And Paul, uh, Fritz, Fritz didn't photograph her. I don't think I ever saw a negative. Of it. I, I have. You have? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because they have a thing about taking their photograph. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, but she was just absolutely thrilled, you know. At first she was, oh, what's this, you know? <laughs> that was fun. Okay. And among the uh, Amerindians, beautiful people. Absolutely beautiful people. And then we went up to the bauxite mines in Cerro Galivo in Venezuela. We never got into Venezuela very far. We went to Caracas, but that was it. It's great. Good. And he continued to, of course, photograph the Virgin Islands till the very end. Oh, course, always. Too. He yeah. loved the people. He photographed. He loved the people. He loved to photograph the people, mm -hmm. as you can see in the show. Well, it's a fascinating And he had a lot of assignments there. He had weddings and portraits to do. and. You know, he mm -hmm. had a family to raise. He, he raised us well. Okay. And to serve that is, 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 is quite remarkable. Yeah. Let me also take you to his neighbor in Puerto Rico to the awards at the end of his life, which, of course, Pablo Casals. <gasps> a remarkable body of work he did uh, that was at the experience. end of Casals' life. Yes. How did that come about? How did that occur? 
somebody on St. Croix, I don't remember who it was exactly, who asked Fritz, would you like to photograph Pablo Casals? I should remember the man's name. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Byron Case or, or the Island Center of the Performing Arts that we had at that point going. But uh, he got in touch with Martita, Marta Casals, mm -hmm. Casals' wife, who was very much younger than him. A very unusual situation. And uh, we went, oh, yes, I mean, he, he, she was 18 years old when he was way up there in age, and she was, she, he taught her. And later in life, he played only her cello, which was an interesting thing. Yeah, he, he played her cello. But we went up there, and the first time we went there, he lived on Kaya on, uh, Himalaya, up high in the hills. And we found the place, but it was up the street quite away from us. And we were walking, taxi had left us, and he told us which house. As we approached it, we heard his cello. Gorgeous. So we followed the music and walked in the house. The door was open, and here he's sitting playing lost, totally lost in his creativity. Fritz walked in the room, Martita greeted us, took us to the side, Fritz got his cameras wet, rather, he agreed to do this. Pablo Casals agreed to, to have him photograph it, but he didn't know we were there. He was as lost in his art as Fritz was in his photography, totally consumed by it, you know. So we went in, Fritz set up the camera and photographed him, and he was playing Bach's The Cerebond, and it was just beautiful. That's how it started. We had, I think, I'm not sure, maybe four visits over there, at least four. And he wrote, under, I think you have the photograph, have in, the the photograph show, in the show, where Pablo Casal signed underneath the photograph. Mm -hmm. He was a beautiful man. Okay. Yeah. Good. And Bill, Fritz made a book of him and his quotations of pa Pablo Casals. I know he quite remarked about just the interesting conversations they had. Too, yes. Wonderful well, conversation. Know, know one another oh, he talked about you. Spain and why he left, and he'd never go back, and he wouldn't be buried there until Franco was dead. Yeah. Okay. Good. The uh, the course of doing this work and the sublying theme I want to, uh, it was, of course, something that has guided Fritz since the very beginning, which was the big B word, the beauty. Uh, and what it meant. And I've had quite fun with the number of curators I've worked with and asked for help with in different aspects of the research of the book of turning around and saying, how do you define beauty? Uh, and get all sorts. Is there any way that you felt comfortable enough with saying what beauty was to Fritz or anything like that? Or is it something that just exists as a theme throughout his life? I think it exists throughout his life because he saw beauty in just about everything. And you know, I don't know if being in Nazi Germany for a while and finally fleeing Nazi Germany, if that ugliness over there had influenced, this is only my thought, had influenced Fritz to reach out for something better. And it was beauty, but he probably was looking for beauty all of his life. It was um, beauty and freedom. I mean, when he left his oh, yeah. country, it was like everything in the world for him to come to America. And he was like, you know, so proud to finally become an American citizen and everything that America represented. So I think the two themes, freedom and beauty, are completely linked. And I don't know if it's really answering that question, but just having been around my dad so much and knowing you know, when he felt like he really, when he captured the essence of something, I felt he felt that that was the beauty in it. No matter what the essence was, that was the beauty of it. Yeah. And he could capture something that may not be, like, necessarily a pretty picture, but the essence was so there mm -hmm. that it was, it's that moment of, I guess I'd call that beauty, okay. to capture the essence of it. Good. Did he give you give you any definition while you were slaving in the dark room? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not specifically, but expanding on what Tina said. I mean, like, taking something that, for instance, after Hugo, the hurricane that devastated St. Croix, yeah. I mean, I look back at that time and it was like, you know, it was total devastation. And then recently I saw a photograph, a color photograph of his, it's 
hanging up there, the sunset out off our deck and it's Princess Helen. It's like the trees are torn up, and the leaves are just coming back, but you know, it's a gorgeous photograph. It's like, how do you make beauty out of a complete, utter de devastation like that? I mean, he does it. <laughs> and y'all went through that thing, that terrifying night, yeah. too, in the house on the hill. So, Is what? You went through Hugo in the house on the hill. You I thought we were going to die that night. Mm -hmm. Martin and Fritz and I were there. The girls were up in the States. Mm -hmm. And it sounded, it came out of the east. I'd never experienced a hurricane before. And, and Martin could see it. He saw this great big dark line. He said, there it is out there, you know. And it hit us in the early, well, already in the afternoon, right? Yeah. Palm trees were bending way over, and the ocean looked absolutely incredible. You're looking down towards where we went for the interview, and yeah. the white caps, they were wild. And, you know, it approached us, got real wild, and we got in the house, and I said, okay, we went into a little room off of the kitchen, it's a little bedroom now, and I made some typical German cold cuts and wine and whatnot. We're going to have a, it was about 8.30 at night. And at, the, at that point, it was getting wild. And the stones were hitting those Miami louvers, the metal ones of ours. And it was like a freight train going by for hours. And when it came to us, really came to us, when the eye came to us, it hovered over us. It didn't Friends. move. And finally it moved and we thought, oh, great. Boy. Came back again. <laughs> but when it hadn't, when it was hovering over us, you could look up, you saw red, and you saw a lot of debris way up there in that, that, in that cone, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh dear. So Martin got us into the west of the house because he had already seen the kitchen roof go off and, and uh, stuff hanging in the living room. And he said, everything's okay, but I think we ought to go west and here we'll be more comfortable here. He was fibbing the whole time, God, which was great. Up. He had a little, little radio or something. He could listen to the Puerto Rican station, <laughs> find out where we are, were in time there. And uh, it was wild. And when I awakened in the morning and looked out, I said, oh my goodness galvanized roofs all over the place. There wasn't a roof on the house all around. It looked like a bomb hit us. Mm. I, mean, I don't know what the velocity was. One, we had tornadoes within it. 140 sustained. <laughs> yeah, okay. 140 sustained, so whoa. And then he goes out afterwards and makes those beautiful images. Yep. So, yes, yes, and he hung, up, he hung up stamps to dry. Oh, Fritz was an avid stamp collector. Uh, one of the young women who stayed with us, they stayed in the guest house up above. They had a cat in a pillowcase. Mm -hmm. They came down. She hung up her dollar bills on the clothesline. <laughs> we had to dry out by then. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. But we were alive, and we had a great time because it brought us real close. Martin uh, Maria came down with chainsaw, pan, you know, Pan Am brought planes down. Some people left then, brought their, took their dogs if they could up. A lot of immigration going on there. They were cutting, Martin was cutting off mahogany limbs. We had mahogany limbs closing in all around, all around our house, you know? We couldn't get That's out. It. He was cutting, and then he built a fire up on the hill a little bit outside of the house. Kept it going all the time, burning the mahogany. I had a little one burner propane. Mm -hmm. To cook on, we had gourmet mo food. He put <laughs> potatoes in metal foil, <laughs> threw it in the fire. When evening came, hey, we had a great time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I were there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, if I may return from, from disaster survival to art for one more moment yet and do it that way. Um, I was always fascinated and I mentioned in the book about this relationship between him and music. Oh, yeah. uh, going all the way back to, of course, when he had his first dark room in the family home underneath the music room right. in the family home. And then that relies and comes upon it too. Are there any memories you have in particular of him and music? Oh my that, goodness. I know that he, didn't, he did not turn into the violin player that they wanted him no, to be. His, but, but no, the piano player. Or the piano player. Yeah. Okay. He wanted to play the piano, but Fritz's hands were a little bit stocky like this. Mm -hmm. Fingers wouldn't go far enough. Okay. But that association with music seems to have Oh, he was madly in love with Mozart all his adult life. Okay. That was his hero. 
And it, with Fritz and I and the family, we listened to classical music all the time. When Fritz passed on, I took up some country music records. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to get you some applause. Here, <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, definitely. Good. I love country music. <laughs> and I love classical music. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> At the conclusion, we wanted to also have you ask questions of anything of them, except perhaps country music. Um, <laughs> if you would. And we have a microphone to pass around for the audience. Uh, if we can do so. Now, David, I know you've got one in your hand. Uh, please, while we have them here and before the escape to the islands, if you have questions, I, I certainly <laughs> invite them. The uh, well, I <laughs> want to keep you here for a long time, but yeah, I know right. you, I, I've been down there. I know what the attraction is, certainly. So if anyone would like to, please raise your hand and let them know. Hello, hello, hello. Guys, uh, thank you for coming to Austin and sharing these incredible experiences of where you guys get a lot of credit. Sometimes the man is the one that has all the credit, but in fact, you guys are the support system for him, so thank you. My question is, being in the Caribbean and dealing with negatives, how do you protect them from the moisture in the sand? You don't. You don't. We don't you keep them there. You send them off island. <laughs> Fritz kept most, all of his negatives in New York, and he had just a really great filing system with his contact sheets, so he had them numbered and he would order. Um, he shot the film and it, it never came back to the island, rarely. So it stayed up in New York? It did until he was more affiliated out here, and then everything came out here. And the, the uh, way to keep files, to be able to find stuff, oh, did he wow. use you want to comment on that? Well, um, <laughs> Fritz was actually really quite organized. Um, but over the years, I mean, we've discovered many, many different numbering systems he had. So um, there, there is a, a system, there is a rhyme to what he did. But most of it at this point is like still in our heads. Um, nothing's really been systematized as much as it could be. but. Um, he was pretty organized, but you know, throughout his career, this, his organization changed depending on who he was working for. Um, and you guys could find it, but other people could maybe not find it. Like Roy, did, were you able to find stuff? Or just, you had to learn all these different systems from different photographers. Well, every photographer has their own system, and Fritz had several, I believe. Several. But, but, but yeah. they were, but uh, if you. Fortunately, he was alive to show us, and then he was alive to teach them and show them. So it was able to be translated to me, so that when the time came to do the research, I could sit down and do it. I mean, there are still pockets of uh, black holes in there, certain things, but for the most part, it's very well organized. Uh, and probably David and, and Mary Allison, our department, can tell you as well, too, that there are collections that are far worse organized than his. Uh, this was his working archive. He used this to live. He used this to make a living and to support family. And the systems worked for him to do it. And thank goodness they did. So. But Roy, whenever yeah. he needed something from St. Croix, he'd get in touch with Peg Wallace. Yes. And for quite a few years, she was the number one who went and pulled the negative for Fritz, then took it to the dark room and had the prints made. Peg is a superb printer here she in is town. Is she here? Is yes. Peg here? I hope she she's here. I love Peg. <laughs> there are, in fact, two people in this town who, who worked very early on doing it. Another person who I think should also get credit because he helped save Fritz's work at the time of a oh. big rainstorm, too, is Walt Lenore, who is a legend here in town, too, and is also among us. And Walt, you should raise your hand, too, because we applaud you for all your work, too. <laughs> so. he, he's touched many lives in the course of working with us since he, we first met him in, I guess, 78 or 79 when he came. And it's, it's, it's just been remarkable to have somebody in my life, at least who I knew from his work in the 50s and 60s, and, and to see them breathing and living and working and creating and uh, collaborating in the course of the time he was here. Uh, we all miss him terribly, but it was uh, really significant for us to be able to experience that in the process. So, Question. 
Pardon? Uh, Stanley? Pardon? Sure. She asked what brought him to UT. Uh, a couple of nice circumstances. Uh, in 1978, he had an exhibit at, uh, in San Antonio. And uh, I believe his name was Dean Myers at the university there, uh, called us up one day and said, we have Fritz Henley here, would you like to meet him? Uh, to which we said, don't move, we're coming. And came down and had a chance to meet him and got to know him, brought him up here and showed him our collection to introduce him to what we had here and the friendship built from there. Another thing that helped too was in 1979, Helmut Gernsheim was a guest teacher here and we of course have the Gernsheim collection here in the collection, so Fritz, timed it in such a way that he was able to meet Helmut and see the collection. And for those of you who don't know, Helmut also grew up in Germany at the same time and, and fled in 1937 and got to Britain. Uh, and they both went to the same school, the same uh, Munich uh, School of Photography, about four years separate, so they didn't know each other as upper or lower classmen. But they both uh, graduated, and they both in fact graduated the head of their classes their particular years. So that sort of friendship of two people in the field who'd never met for 40 years uh, really helped to cement the friendship too. And then from there we began work uh, with, the, with the help of the gentleman who funded the, the Master Print Project. Fairly Dickinson. Fairly Dickinson. Fairly Dickinson uh, got us started with the funding project to build what became the Fritz Henley Master Print Collection of his final summary statement of his master prints of his select images that we worked on for many years with him while he was organizing the archive. So that in very brief is how it built uh, up to do it. And it was a tremendous pleasure each year acquiring and adding the prints to the collection and getting the anecdotes that went with every single print too, <laughs> with it, which was fascinating. So that's how it began. Yes. We always said it was genetic. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the blood. <laughs> I mean, growing up constantly with the art around you, like that from birth to, you know, going through high school and all, it's every, you know, you're surrounded by the photography all the time and you're helping them on photo shoots when you're little. I mean, I remember quite a few times, maybe nine or 10, helping dad go take photos of the refinery on St. Croix. And I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> so we went out and I assisted him, so, things yeah. like that. Yeah, we, we basically lived it and breathed it. I mean, the man was literally glued to what he did. That camera lived around his neck. It was his first thing. It was just, he never Flash. stopped looking. So we, that's what we knew. And the, what I really appreciated about him, especially, I mean, I appreciate it even more now, is he wasn't, um, he was always really, really encouraging of us, all of us, and in doing whatever we wanted to do. He didn't impose what he thought we should do. And, um, you know, he just like, I said when I went on, you know, that, that semester abroad, basically he gave me my film and, you know, he taught me some really basic things in terms of exposure, you know, under, uh, overexpose, underdevelop, and, you know, with the black and white, and, you know, very, very little, though, about telling me how to see. Mm -hmm. And I really, really thank him for that today, because it gave me a space to just, you know, take that tool and look myself. And, um, you know, I had fans in my own life when I didn't do photography, and, you know, I have to say, um, it was phenomenal growing up with Fritz, and it was also really challenging um, growing up with somebody of his energy. He was a small man, but he was so creative, and people of that level of creativity, they just, you know, when we were working with him in his later years here, when he was in his 70s, we were exhausted. You know, I was in my 20s and 30s, and it's like, he just, like, exhausted me. But he was just whoo, so driven. So, um, you know, that's, that's as a result, you know, it was, 
you know, when I first started picking up the camera, it was extremely encouraging of me to continue it. But it was also very challenging because, you know, growing up with that much fame and, you know, under his shadow had its challenges that it does for most people, you know, in that situation. So I actually divorced myself from it for many years and went in a very different direction in my life, you know, for a while. And he never stopped me from doing that either. You know, he just totally supported whatever I wanted to do to find my own self-expression. And I think, you know, he knew that so much for himself that that was like the hugest gift he could have given any of us. You know, and my older sister Maria, who passed away a couple of years ago, she just, you know, he was so encouraging of her art. And, um, you know, she just totally became who she was out of that. So, you know, Fritz imparted that sense of freedom and no, I was say it's freedom. just be yourself, yeah. you know. And so, especially when I gave it up, that was the biggest gift, you know, because it was like, I can't be under this. I can't stand anybody else saying you're walking in your father's footsteps anymore, you know. We used to Seriously. hear that all the time. It was really difficult. And now today, it's like I feel I have my own yeah. sense of myself and my own work. And it's like when people, people actually don't even say that to me anymore, which I find really yeah, interesting. And if something comes up, I just feel like, God, I had this phenomenal teacher. And I just thought, <laughs> oh, what an amazing life. And not, not this rebel that I was for a long time. So. so maybe perhaps freedom is like beauty in that it has no absolute definition. It is something that's felt, it's something that's produced, it's something that's experienced rather than defined. Mm. Yeah. Perhaps that's it. We have time for another question yet, please. Yes, uh, two questions please. Okay. Uh, slightly technical questions. Um, taking the black and white photographs, did he use color filters uh, of different kinds to get different uh, contrast effects. And secondly, in the dark room, he obviously dodged and burned to manip manipulate the exposure on the paper, but did he use different kinds of developers on the same exposure to manipulate the whites and the blacks? In the experience I had with him, no. Um, but he did use filters. Um, certainly on his camera for black and white. I mean, there were a lot of orange, orange and yellow filters almost always. I think he used a yellow filter yellow even filter. for all of his portraiture. Yeah. And then in the Caribbean, um, the light was just so incredibly stark there. Um, very often for you know, his mm -hmm. more landscape shots, he often used an orange filter. Oh, almost always yellow and or orange. Mm -hmm. He also did use a tripod a lot too, I believe, as well. At least in certain shooting situations, oh, yeah. Yeah. Time. So, yeah. Yeah. In his earlier work, and I don't know that much about his printing then, but you may know more in your research of him. Mm -hmm. um, when he was in New York in the '30s and '40s, he has some very interesting manipulated, multiple exposures, oh, yeah. probably multiple developers, papers, etc. So. Uh, he w he w I, the interesting thing was he would try many things. I don't think he ever married to one particular gimmick or one particular style in that respect. But he would try. Uh, there are a couple of, there's one nude in the show, for example, that is triple exposure to sort of make it. Solarization? Yeah, he was going yeah. for a sort of an oriental turtle look and the color nude with the solarization yeah. too sort of worked. So he would try different techniques when he felt moved and urged to do it. But well, what I found fascinating was he did not get hung up on a particular technique. Uh, all this was sort of these wonderful tools to work with, if you will, I guess to go back to the music analogy, he knew the basic theme and the basic song and he could play the variations and come back to the melody. And that's what he did constantly throughout his work. So, yes. Uh, I would just add that I was trying to figure out how to sum up the evening to thank you all. And I got an email today from a photographer I, I, who was an old friend in Rhode Island named Bart Parker one of the modern age of photographers who wrote me just out of the blue. I would invited him to the Fritz work and he couldn't make it in from Rhode Island because uh, Bart's in his 70s and a bit laid up now too, but he sent me an email and I wanted to paraphrase a part of it tonight because I think he wrote it better than most could. I love Henley and I love his work and it's possible that his work put off some people because it was literate, relativistic, and keenly linking the actual to long dreams and experience. I finally realized that many photographers, artists, and critics
just don't like us romantics, suspecting any work that is not true or tough or manly, and wearing a seed cap. Live lighter. I have always loved that fellow's romantic take on things. I always will. He is someone who always seemed to be moving west, just leaving around the corner. I can't say it Lovely. better than that. Yes. Marguerite, Dina, Martin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.